Good morning. It's uh, great to see everyone this morning. It's first day of the week and daylight savings time. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe a few of our folks that uh, may come in a little bit later that didn't set their clocks last night. So, uh, But it's good to see everyone. Our members, it's good to see you. And if you're visiting with us today, we're excited that you came our way today and invite you to come back at any opportunity that you may have. And if you would, uh, do us a favor and uh, fill out uh, one of the visitor's cards that you'll find on uh, some of the seats on the end especially. And if you're a member here and you see a visitor, if you'd pass them a card, that would be helpful. And uh, fill that out and you can drop it in the uh, uh, baskets for the uh, uh, contribution uh, when you exit today. If you're looking for a church home, this is the place you need to be. Our uh, scripture reading for today, if you'll be turning to that, will be in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 31. While you're turning to that, uh, a few announcements that uh, uh, I'd like to mention. Uh, our sympathy is extended to the family of Pete Smith, the father of Bonnie Wright. Uh, his funeral was on Thursday. If you would like to have any of the uh, old songbooks, uh, please pick them up in the foyer uh, at the information table. So if you'd like to have some of those uh, uh, books, just uh, take them with you. Uh, please drop off jeans and, or pants for journey home today. Today's the deadline for that, so you can bring those in uh, tonight as well. Uh, jo uh, Brother Joshua is resuming uh, Bible Bros for March 15th at Slig Pick barbecue at 6 p.m. Uh, this is for guys ages 13 through 35. Uh, please see uh, Brother Joshua if you have any questions about that. Uh, special kids race is March the 19th. Uh, if you can assist with the Salem Creek Water Station, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that as well. Uh, there's a devotional scheduled for college, young adult ages here at the building on March 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, pr uh, please bring sporting equipment such as basketballs, footballs, etc., for use after the devotional. Uh, Senior Saints, uh, it, dinner is planned for April the 9th at 5 p.m. with a financial planning session focused on Social Security following the meal. So if you're getting to that age where you need to be thinking about Social Security, uh, uh, please come to that meeting and, and obtain some information. It's open for ages 50 and above. So we've changed that from 60 and up to 50 and up for those who uh, need to find out information about Social Security. So uh, sign up in the foyer by April the 3rd uh, if you plan to attend that. Uh, and, of course, our couples retreat is next weekend, uh, and please keep those who are traveling to uh, Gatlinburg for that retreat uh, in your, your prayers. Scripture reading, Mark 12, 28 through 31, in preparation for Brother Joshua's lesson this morning. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather together this morning to study from your word, to hear, sing praises to you, and come to you through this avenue of prayer and, and to hear another uh, message from your word. Father, we're so thankful for each family here at Salem Creek, and, and we're thankful for the visitors that we have today, and bless each family, continue to watch over them. Father, we ask that uh, everything we do here today be according to your will and for your glory. Father, we're so thankful for your son and his sacrifice on the cross and the example that he lived on, uh, while he's here on this earth. Father, we ask that you help us always to look to you in all things and put our faith and our trust in you each day. These things we pray in your name. Amen. 
Brother Hayden will now come and lead us in our singing. Good morning. Let's stand while we sing together number 836. How I love the great Redeemer who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story of the love that makes men free. Till my earthly life is ended, I will sing songs above them beside the crystal sea. Two eighty nine. Two eight nine.
Testing 665. Till the swarm passes by. Would you bow with me as we pray? All wise and merciful Father in heaven, we bow before you at this time, Lord, with thankfulness in our hearts for the blessings of a night of rest, for the health and strength that we might assemble this morning at this place to lift our voices in songs of praise to your high and matchless name, to bow and petition you with thoughts of prayer the things that we might beseech thee for. Lord, we know that thou art the Almighty, that all things we have come from thy precious hand, and that through the blessings of you sending your Son to this earth or allowing him to come, we have an opportunity to be a part of your kingdom and to serve in that kingdom. We ask you, Lord, to bless us in that we lifted our voices of song to you this morning. We pray that we did so pleasingly and that we made a joyful noise unto you. Lord, we pray that you would watch over and cure those that were not able to be in our midst this morning due to sickness, physical ailments, 
and things that would prevent them from being here. We ask if it be your will that these things they might overcome or they might be able to regain strength for they might again assemble with us together here to worship you, the almighty God. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those that have lost loved ones, those that are sad and sorrowful over this. It is a sad occasion. It is a time of grieving, but it is also a time of blessing. We ask that you help us through these times and help those that are suffering over this loss at this occasion. Lord, we pray that you would continue to be with our congregation as we strive to serve you in this community, in this state, city, this country, and help us to be mindful of those around the world. Please help us in the things that have been chosen, that they are successful in expanding the borders of your kingdom, bringing the word to those that have not had opportunity to hear the special things that Jesus' word has to say to us. We ask you, Lord, to be with Brother Joshua this morning as he brings us a message from thy word. May he have a recollection of the things he studied and prepared that he may present them in the manner that would touch our hearts and cause us to survey ourselves and do those things that are necessary to be as you would have us to be. At this time, we ask that you forgive us of the mistakes and the shortcomings that we have that we might stand just and pure in your sight this morning. We, Lord, ask you to continue to be with our eldership at this congregation. Help them in their thought process and decisions that must be made and they are making to help us to be able to stay in proper relationship with your word and be going forward in those things that we need to be involved in and that we need to be spreading the word to those that have not heard and to remind those that have heard of the needs that they have to be steadfast and unmovable. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the activities of our congregation in encouraging and causing each of us to strive more diligently to be your child and be in a more perfect manner. We ask you now, Lord, to bless us through the rest of this service, to help us to be mindful of the things that we need to do to set the right example as we walk before thee each day this week. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Number 473. There is a name I love to be.
invitation song this morning will be number 667, if you'd like to mark that in the books, 667. Then before a lesson, let's stand and sing together number 756, when we all get to heaven. Great to see everyone here this morning, a wonderful, wonderful crowd with several visitors. So thank you for coming our way, and if you're looking for a church home, we would love to be that for you. Uh, and hopefully you can see today as we have worshipped, and as we get a chance to study the Word of God, that we're going to be a people who love God and love each other, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So if you want to, open with me to Mark chapter 12, where we read from earlier. Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. We're going to look this morning at the greatest command, this double command to love God and love each other. I get made fun of sometimes because I like school. It's not so much that I like school as it is that I've just been in school for a long time. I've been in school since I was three years old consecutively and still am in school. And, and I can write a paper. I don't care. I can write a paper. My master's thesis was 112 pages long. I don't mind writing papers. Taking tests, that's another thing. I don't like taking tests. Most people don't like taking tests, and most of us aren't good at taking tests. As a matter of fact, 20% of students say that they get test anxiety. Now, what does that mean? It means that they get so nervous about taking the test that they forget what they've studied. They can't do well on the test. And honestly, I was surprised when I saw that statistic, not because it's 20%, but because it's only 20%. I thought it would be a lot higher than that. I don't like taking tests, but I really didn't like taking tests when I was working on my master's degree. As like I said, I wrote a master's thesis and that's fine, but once you get to the end of the master's program, you have to take comprehensive finals. And that was a scary word. That was a bad word in my house. I don't like comprehensive finals because comprehensive means everything. You have to know every word that the professor said in every class that you had taken from the beginning until that point, and you could be tested over it. And you better know how to give an answer. And I didn't like that, because I'm really good at forgetting stuff. 
kind of like Neville in Harry Potter. I can't remember what I've forgotten. That's how I feel sometimes. Well, we get to comprehensive finals, and the secretary of the Bible department, Freed Hardeman, ushered us down into a glorified janitor's closet. There was a lamp and a desk. We had to sit there and take our exams. But you know, I learned that if I could just remember the highlight points, if I could just keep the main thing the main thing, then everything else would start flowing out. Now, in Mark chapter 12, it is the Wednesday before Jesus dies. And Jesus is being given, he's, he's having questions given to him over and over and over again. He's taking his final exam. And it is a comprehensive final because the questions that Jesus get asked are very difficult and they're very broad. Now the interesting thing is that Jesus begins answering questions from a very broad group of people and as the questions become more broad, the questioners become more narrow. So in Mark, in Mark chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to trap him with his own words. You ever had somebody like that? You ever had somebody try to just trip you up over your words? When I was going to auction school, for the first hour every morning, we would have to say tongue twisters. We would say things like rubber baby buggy bumper. Try doing that 15 times fast. Or my personal favorite was Betty Botter. It's kind of long. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said this butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. So she bought a bit of better butter, put it in her bitter batter, made the bitter batter better. So tis better Betty Botter bought a bit of better butter. Now that deserves a raise, don't it? But we had to do that. We had to do it over and over and over again. And the reason was because we were trying to trip up over our words. Because if you trip up over your words, you can go back and you can do better. These people are trying to get Jesus to trip up over his words. So they ask him. The Pharisees and the Herodians, the first ones, they ask him a question about taxes. It's kind of like Thanksgiving. You talk about religion and politics, and that's exactly what's happening here. Now, the Pharisees believed in the inspiration of the entire Old Testament, and they believed in the authority of the oral law, this rabbinical tradition that had been passed down, this commentary on the Old Testament. So they're what we might call the religious liberals because they have a broad interpretation of Scripture. But it's not just the Pharisees. There's also the Herodians. The Herodians are Jews who like Herod. They think that Herod and Roman control is a good thing and they want to advocate for that. Now usually the Pharisees and the Herodians don't get along with each other, but isn't it interesting how Jesus brings people together? So you have the Pharisees and the Herodians who are asking Jesus a question about taxes and Jesus answers it well. Well then you get a more narrow group of people, it's a smaller group of people, the Sadducees. And the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses. They rejected everything else. They rejected the oral law. And if it wasn't in those first five books, they didn't want it. And so arguably, and I say arguably because I believe it is, but arguably resurrection doesn't occur in the first five books of our Old Testament. And so the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they asked Jesus a question about the resurrection. And Jesus gives them an answer. Well, then we finally come to verse 28. And it just seems like this guy, this questioner, is in the background and he's hearing the debate and everything and he finally decides he's going to give it his shot. Now, I don't know how your Bible translates this term. Most Bibles translate it as scribe or an expert in the law. But some of your Bibles may say a lawyer. I assure you this man is not a civil servant. He is an expert in the Jewish law. He's an expert in the law of Moses. Why do we call him that? Well, the Greek term is the word grammatikos, which is where we get our word grammarian. This guy makes a living doing write-offs. You remember getting in trouble in elementary school and having to do write-offs? The reason we did write-offs was so you would memorize what you were writing off. Well, this man was a professional write-off. He copied the Hebrew text of Scripture every day. And the Jews were meticulous with their copying. If there was one mistake, if the number of letters didn't match up, 
that, that copy was no good and they would get rid of it. So this man knew the law. He was an expert in the law. And so he asked Jesus a question. And so as the questioners get more narrow, the questions get more broad. First we have a question about taxes. Then we have a question about the resurrection. And now we have a question about commands. The question is simple. What is the most important commandment? What is the most important commandment? Now the question seems to us to be very simple. And it's difficult looking at this on the face value because we know because what Jesus says is the mantra of the church. We want to love God and we want to love each other. A lot of churches even have it printed on their letterhead. This is our mission statement. Love God and love each other. As well it should because as Jesus says it is the greatest commandment. But this is actually a difficult question. What makes it difficult? Well, the law of Moses has 613 commandments to choose from. Which one is the most important? Do you see how this lawyer is trying to trap Jesus in his words? Which one's the most important? Well, if you believe that the word of God is inspired, if you believe God wrote the law with his finger, if you believe that the, the laws are straight from him, how can you put one above the other? And so it's like walking on eggshells. Jesus has a difficult task in answering this question. So the questions get more narrow. The questioners, or the questioners get more narrow. The questions get more broad. But here's the thing. You can give an exam to a student to test his knowledge. And he will either do well or he will do poor. It's a different game entirely when you're giving an exam to the author of the textbook. At Freed Hardeman, we had graduate symposiums. And this was where the, the graduate Bible department would bring in speakers and they would do a lecture series on a book that they had written or something. Very beneficial and really interesting. And at the end, we would get to ask them questions. And so usually for our required reading, we were reading their book. And, and we would ask them questions from the book. And we would say, well, Dr. So-and-so, you said on page 62, this, this, and this. What exactly did you mean by that? And because that man wrote the textbook, he could give us an answer. Jesus says in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. This is what Jesus is saying there. Before Abraham even took his first breath, I am. I existed. The words I am is the covenant name of God. You may have heard it pronounced as Yahweh. We really don't know how that word should be pronounced because the vowel pointings are difficult. Y-H-W-H. -H, Yahweh. It's a form of the verb to be in Hebrew, Hayah. And it means ever present, always existing. It's the verb of existence. And Jesus makes the bold statement. A human being, could you imagine hearing a human being saying this? We'd probably think he was crazy too. Before the father of the Jews even drew his first breath, I am. They didn't bet on asking the question to the author of the textbook. So here's what Jesus says, verse 29. Jesus answered, the most important is, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Now, we take these as two separate commands. But it is a double command to love. It is one command. Understand this. The scribe, the lawyer, whatever you want to call him, asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? commandment singular and Jesus answers with a singular answer because if you don't have one you can't have the other and so he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 and verse 5 and then he quotes from Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 so let's take the first one first Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with every single part of your being. Now my question is, why quote Deuteronomy 
Because Deuteronomy 6, 5 begins the, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So why quote verse 4? Those of us who are married, I want to give you a little quiz since we're talking about exams. I'll give you a little quiz. Tell me the day, the minute, the second that you decided that you loved your spouse. Give me the number. I can't do that. I don't know about you. Maybe you can. I can't do that. It's an impossible question because relationships build and as you grow to learn the person that you will love, that's what makes love what it is because you're growing to know that person. Jesus starts with Deuteronomy 6.4, I think, because unless you know who you love, you cannot appropriately love them. Now, Deuteronomy 6.4 starts the, the prayer of the Shema. And Deuteronomy 6.5 is the Ve'ahavta. The Jews prayed these twice daily, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. So maybe it is, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but maybe it is that Jesus starts in verse 4 simply because that's the prayer. And that's what people would have been familiar with. But I think it's more than that. You have to know who you love in order to love them. I heard Keith Parker say this one time. He said, love is not a feeling that you feel like you're feeling when you feel a feeling that you've never felt before. Let me say that again so you tweet it right. Love is not a feeling that you feel like you're feeling when you feel a feeling that you've never felt before. Y'all ever backed up to an electric fence? You feel a feeling that you've never felt before, but it ain't love. What does it mean to love God? Well, Jesus tells us what's it, what it means. First, you have to know who God is. You have to know that He is one. This is the mantra of Jewish monotheism. And it's the statement of our faith. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. That's the way the Hebrews would talk if they wanted you to do something with your entire being. Your whole being should love the Lord. You can't just love someone in your mind and your actions not dictate it. You can't just have that fuzzy feeling inside your heart and not have it in your mind. Our entire being should be wrapped up in loving the Lord. And how do we do that? Well, we do it through a number of ways, not least of which is loving each other. We do it through our praise, through our worship, through our prayer life, through reading scripture, through our devotion. That's how we love the Lord. We love the Lord by obeying the laws of love. And the first law of love is the law of priority. God does not want to be first in our lives. He wants to be the entirety of our lives. There is a difference. Everything that I am, all that I do should be wrapped up in God. Then Jesus says the second is like it. To love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Well, that's easy enough. I like my neighbors. You all are my neighbors. I love you. But you know, there's another story in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 10, where, believe it or not, another scribe, another lawyer, asks Jesus this question. And then he presses it a little further and he says... Well, hold on, Jesus. You want me to love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives that beautiful parable of the good Samaritan. And in that parable, you have a man who is robbed and left for dead. And you have the two most spiritual people on the planet pass by him and walk along on the other side. But then you have the Samaritan. This man who a regular Jew would have nothing to do with. Who takes time out of his day and money out of his pocket to care for someone who needed it. Who's my neighbor? Absolutely anyone. Anyone. Now unfortunately we have mistaken 
the term love for the term acceptance. That if I'm going to love my neighbor, I just have to accept you as you are. And if I'm unwilling to do that, that means I don't love you. But that's not the case. In fact, that's not at all what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that because we love people, we show them who the Lord is. And we pray for them. And we rejoice with them. And we weep with them. And whatever their need is, we do our best to take care of it. Love doesn't mean acceptance. We're not called to accept people in their sin. But our love for them, seeing them as a human being, seeing them as a lost soul, means that we have no other option, none other than to teach them in love and truth about the grace and mercy of our Lord. It is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus gives this depiction of the judgment day where he separates the sheep from the goats. And he tells them whether they will depart from him or whether they will be drawn to him is based on what they did to the least of these. Jesus says, when you saw me naked, you clothed me. When you saw me hungry, you fed me. When you saw me thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you took care of me. All of these things come in. And then the people respond. Both sets of groups, interestingly enough, respond, Lord, when did we see you like this? And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Doing it to the least of these is loving our neighbor. When we love our neighbor, we in turn love the Lord. And if we love the Lord, we will love our neighbor. You cannot have one without the other. So Jesus ends by saying there is no other commandment greater than these. Now why is that? 613 commands, and you can't have a single one of them without first starting with these two. Let's start smaller. Take the Ten Commandments. You cannot have the Ten Commandments without having a love for the Lord and a love for your neighbor. It's been said many times and written in many commentaries that the Ten Commandments are divided in half. The first five deal with our relationship to God, and the last five deal with with our relationship to each other. Now what's interesting is that this expert in the law, this scribe, in verse 32 continues, he says, that's true, teacher. You're right to say he is one and there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all your heart, all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. If you're familiar with your prophets, especially the minor prophets, we know that all too well. Because the people of Israel were offering their sacrifices, they were going through the motions, they did not have a heart of love. I wonder how often it is that we come on the first day of the week, on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or maybe a midweek Bible study, and we go through the motions and our heart is not in it. Love God, love your neighbor. These are more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered thoughtfully, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Then no one dared any longer to question him. It's interesting to see Jesus' perspective of people. If you'll jump down with me to verse 38, Jesus also said, watch out for the experts in the law. Don't you love that? You better look out for these folks. They're, they like walking around in long robes and elaborate gr uh, greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' property. And as a show, make long prayers. These men will receive a more severe punishment. You see, not every scribe was like the scribe who was asking the question to Jesus. Most scribes would have tried to argue the point. Most scribes would have pressed it further. I don't know if you've ever had to sit on jury duty or maybe you've even had to take the stand, but it's a very nerve-wracking thing when the lawyer comes up and starts asking you questions. 
Most experts in the law would have pushed it further, but not this man. This man says, you know what, teacher, you're absolutely right. These are the greatest. They're more important than anything we do. If we don't have this, we have nothing. But here's what Jesus responds with. Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom of God. When we come to the cross with a desire to love God because He first loved us, and because He loves us, that gives us the strength and ability to love each other. When we come to the cross and we lay all our burdens at Jesus' feet, there is only one answer, and it is love. Love for the Lord and love for for each other. You've heard it said, this said before, I know you have. But the cross runs vertically and horizontally. And I don't think that there's any secret symbolism in that. But I like what somebody said one time that the vertical is a reminder that we have a love that points up, that we have a devotion that looks to heaven. That we love the Lord with all of our being. Everything that we do, do all things for the glory and honor of God. But the cross also runs horizontally. And it's a reminder that we have a charge to love our neighbor. To do good to all, especially those to the household of faith. We like to focus on the household of faith part, but let's not forget... What precedes that, do good to all. Love everyone. Love your neighbor. Doesn't mean accept. Now I wonder how many of us today can honestly say that we love God with our entire being. All that we are, all that we do is directed to Him. I wonder how many of us can say, I have a genuine love and concern For my fellow man. And because of that, I want to spread the gospel. I want people to know the love of the Lord. And if you are questioning this morning, if God loves you, let me in the next three minutes tell you a small story. God came here. And He came just like all the rest of us has come into this world. He came born of woman, and he was born in the worst conditions, and he lived a humble life. He wasn't a rich man. The God of heaven, the King of kings and Lord of lords, lived just like you and I do. The only difference is he did it perfectly. He lived in every way that we could not, and people hated him for it. They called him a blasphemer. They said, what you're teaching us is wrong. And they killed him. They put him on a cross. The most shameful way to die in the Roman Empire. And God's people killed God. But that was necessary. Because not only did God come to earth... God offered Himself on behalf of all of us. He is the perfect Lamb that was slain for us. And His blood cleanses us from our sin. Now I told you God's people killed God. But here's the good news. God doesn't stay dead. He rose again three days later. And he is seated on his throne in power today. And his kingdom is here. Jesus tells this scribe, you're not far from the kingdom. Guess what, friends? Kingdom is here. How many of us today can say that we're in it? And how many of us are painfully saying, we're not in it, but maybe we're not far from it. Jesus died, was buried, and was raised. And so too, we can die with Him, be buried with Him, and be raised to walk in newness of life. We do that through the act of baptism, as we're commanded in Scripture. 
But baptism is just getting wet had it not been for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which makes love for God and love for each other possible. That's our challenge. Without it, we are far from the kingdom of God. If you need to become a Christian this morning, if you need to put him on in baptism, or if you need the prayers of the church, now is the time to show your love for God and let your fellow man show our love for you. Whatever your need is this morning, will you come while we stand and sing? As we prepare our thoughts for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing Lamb of God.
If you will be turning to uh, Matthew chapter 26. Is there anyone that doesn't have a communion kit? If you raise your hand, someone will bring one to you. Okay. Have you ever heard the phrase, Jesus freely or willingly went to the cross for us? Let's look at a few verses in Matthew 26. Um, First one is verse 39. This is when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he gone a little, little farther, he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then skip down to verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But then how could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? And at that hour, crowds came. How have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sit in the temple teaching and did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. So in these verses... We see Jesus, he wanted God's will to be done. And we see that if he had wanted to, he mentions he could have called 12 legions of angels. One legion of Roman soldiers was about 6,000 men. So 12 legions would have been 72,000 angels. I looked up the capacity of Nissan Stadium, that's around 69,000 people. You think about Nissan Stadium full with another 3,000 people standing on the field, that would have been about 72,000 people. So yes, Jesus had that capacity. He could have called those angels. And that reminded me of a song that we sing, 10,000 Angels. And it mentions, you know, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. So Jesus, he wanted to obey the will of his father. If he'd wanted to, he could have called multitudes of angels to help him in his time of need. If you think about all the things he went through, his arrest, his beatings, the mocking, the insults, the flogging, the crucifixion itself on the cross. But he did the will of his father. And why did he do that? He had committed no sins. He did that for us because of our sins. He gave his life on the cross, shed his blood, that we might have salvation. And then we have the hope of heaven someday in the future. So let's partake of the Lord's Supper now and think of this. Will you pray with me? Dear Holy Father, we're thankful for this bread, which represents Christ's holy body his body that he did freely and willingly allow to be hung on that cross of Calvary, his body that did die on that cross. And he did that for us, dear Heavenly Father, that we know he did that so our sins could be forgiven. And now upon this first day of the week, as we do every Lord's Day, we have this opportunity to partake of these emblems which represents your son. Now we have the bread which represents his body, and let us take of it in a manner pleasing to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Will you pray with me again? Don't we, Father, now we have this fruit of the vine, which represents Christ's precious blood. The blood that flowed freely on the cross. The blood that, even today, cleanses us of our sins. We're so thankful that he loved us so much 
that he did that for us, Heavenly Father. And now we have the opportunity to partake of this fruit of the vine that does represent Christ's blood. And let us do so in a manner pleasing to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you haven't already put your contribution in the baskets in the back, as you leave this morning, you can do that. So let's pray for the contribution now. Heavenly Father, you bless us so much. There are so many blessings we receive each and every day of our lives, and many of them we take for granted. But every Lord's Day, we have this opportunity, like this morning, to give back to you. And we'll pray that you bless these funds and we pray for the eldership that has overseeing of this funds and all the good works that are done in this congregation. And as we give, let us open our hearts and do so willingly and freely and cheerfully to give back to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Again, it's good to see everyone here, and if you're visiting with us, we again welcome you and hope you'll come back at every opportunity. As we close this morning, let's stand and sing 572. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless bow. Dear Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you have blessed us with. We thank you for our material blessings as well as our spiritual blessings. Dear Lord, we've had a lot of communications today about those that have lost loved ones, those that are having health issues. We ask that you guide them and encourage them uh, uh, to a better road. Uh, we thank you for the lesson that Brother Joshua brought to us. We thank you for the love that you have for us and that we have for you and that we should always love our neighbor and to be an encouragement every time we can of kindness and goodness to our neighbors. Dear Lord, there's a lot of current events that are going on right now around the world. We ask that you be with the people in Ukraine, that this conflict will be resolved soon and that uh, they can get back to their normalcies uh, of life. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us, but most of all, we thank you for your son who came to this world, died on the cross for our sins. We ask that you give us safe passage to our next destination and that we gather again here this evening uh, for another word from your Bible. In your son's name we pray, amen.
Well, it's, it is time for us to begin. It's past time for us to begin. Uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3 today, and we're going to be looking at the purpose of the law. And before we get into that, I'd like for us to bow and we'll go to God in prayer. Let's bow together. Father, we give you thanks for today and every blessing you've given to us. We thank you for the opportunity we have right now to be together in studying your word. We're thankful for Christ our Savior. We're thankful that through faith in him, we can be made right with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be focusing today on uh, the part of this chapter that begins at verse 19. And uh, I want to just begin reading there, and uh, we'll go back then and uh, make some comments. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained by angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up everyone unto sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. And so... I don't know that we'll get through all of that text today. We're going to get through as much of it as, uh, as we possibly can. And by the way, uh, next week I will be uh, in Gatlinburg for the couples retreat. Uh, so I'll not be here teaching class. Uh, Randy Willie is going to fill in in my place. Somebody, I don't know who, but somebody is going to preach in my absence uh, next Sunday morning. Uh, I'll be preaching up in the mountains, but uh, I know whoever it is is going to do a tremendous job. By the way, uh, we have Chris and Natalie with us today. Um, when we get to the fourth Sunday night in April, I want you all to stay home. I mean, seriously, I want you to come and hear Chris. He is going to preach to us on the fourth Sunday night in April. And by the way, didn't Marvin do a good job back on the fourth Sunday night? in February. Uh, fourth Sunday night in April, our speaker is going to be Chris. He grew up here. He interned with us here back when we had uh, a preaching ministry intern. Uh, he's working as a chaplain at the VA hospital here in town. You have to be very highly educated to do that. And um, I'm just excited about having him speak. He grew up in uh, in my den, in my living room, playing Rook on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. John Houston is going to be preaching next Sunday morning in my absence. Thank you for that information. All right, there's some things we've got to think about. In the verses leading up to the passage that I just read, we learned that the promise to, uh, of God to Abraham takes precedence over the law that was given uh, through Moses. And uh, the conclusion to that discussion is found here in verses 17 and 18 of Galatians chapter 3. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later, that is later after the promises made to Abraham, it does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. 
For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on promise. But God granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Where we are right now, justified through Jesus Christ, made right with God, is based on the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. When you think about that, the promises of God uh, that he made to Abraham, which extend to us, do not end your thinking about that at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Just think about that as being the beginning place where the seamstress stuck the needle in with the thread and started a thread that runs throughout the Old Testament. And it's amazing to me, looking here and there in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Genesis, but really throughout the Old Testament, it's amazing to me how often you run into something related to the promises that God made to Abraham. It may be a repetition of them to his descendants like Isaac and Jacob. It may be an explanation. It may be an enlargement of that. But we're here today who we are as children of God with sins washed away in a relationship with God living in the kingdom of heaven because of the promises that God made to Abraham. So the question comes up then, does righteousness come through the law or does it come through the faith of Christ? Does it come through the gospel or does it come through Moses? And let me hear, yeah, we've got to go with this. So is it through the law or is it through faith? And if you think about Jesus, in John chapter 1 verse 17, we're told that the law came through Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. A very simple reminder there of that. Uh, my guess is that many of us can very well appreciate the internal struggle that comes from trying to reach God through our own failed attempts at perfection. Can you relate to the man who came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Matthew chapter 19 in verse 16, and Jesus enumerated several of those commands. He said to Jesus, all of these things I have kept from my youth up. An objective reader of that text would be thinking, well, have you really? Have you really? If you came to me and said, preacher, I have kept all the commandments from the time I was a little boy. I would be saying, oh, really? You might be able to say that most of the time you've tried to keep all of the commandments. But I'll assure you, you have not been successful in keeping all of them. The prodigal son's elder brother represented a mentality that some folks possess. So many years I've been serving you, I have never neglected a command of yours. Luke chapter 15 and verse 29. There was the Pharisee uh, who, un um, there was Pharisee who understood the feeling that we have uh, in, in Romans chapter seven and verse 24. And that Pharisee, used to be Pharisee, was named the apostle Paul. I find then the principle that evil is within me, the one who wants to do good, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. And then he says, wretched man that I am, who shall set me free from the body of this death? And so you can sense the inner struggle that he deals with, knowing what is right, knowing the commandments of God, having a desire to be obedient to God, to be faithful to God, to keep the commandments. But he also knows with his body, he breaks those commands. And you could also say, with my heart, I break the commands of God. So if, if that is your standard, trying to 
keep that perfectly and you are sincere about that and you truly love the Lord, you recognize you have failings and you have faults, but you think that's the way you get there, you're probably going to identify with him when he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death, Romans chapter 7, verse 21 to 24. So the gospel, <clears throat> excuse me, is the good news that we are righteous, not as a result of keeping the law, but as a result of a promise God made to Abraham. As Paul continued this letter here to the churches in Galatia, uh, he seems to, <coughs> excuse me, then anticipate a question that they might ask. Righteousness doesn't come through the law. It comes by faith in Christ Jesus. So in the classroom, the hand goes up and somebody says, well, teacher, rabbi, why it, then is it that we have the law? And so that's the question we're going to look at today in this passage of Scripture. Why do we have the law? Before I proceed, let me go back and become a broken record once more. I think it is absolutely good news that justification is on the basis of faith in Christ Jesus. Not having to show up like a kid bringing his report card home from school who has made straight A's. Unfortunately, I never lived to see that day. I never brought home a report card that had straight A's. I came very close for an entire year, my fourth grade year. I had straight A's on every single report card, every single subject except one. And you know what that one was? I failed recess. No, it wasn't that. Back in those days in Alabama, you got a grade for penmanship, a grade for handwriting. Have you ever seen my writing? Well, four straight report cards, all A's in every subject except one, four straight report cards, I got a C in penmanship. The teacher was probably being gracious. And I thought that was one, no offense to teachers, I thought that was one of two or three things that I saw during my school career that I, I thought was extremely unfair. I should be knocked out of having straight A's because the teacher didn't like my penmanship. You know, just t take the report card, run it through the paper shredder. Okay, there's a point here. Righteousness achieved by works of law. You're gonna, you wanna go that way? You're gonna bring your report card home and show it to God. And if he's like my mother, he's gonna go, what do you mean getting a C in geometry? I was thankful for that, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that, friend Sill, Ms. Math teacher. What have I handed her? That report card, that checklist, is it perfect or is it messed up? It's messed up, wasn't it? Do you want to try to be right with God on that basis? I don't know about you, I don't. And so I'm very thankful, I consider it good news of the highest order, that justification is on the basis of faith in Christ Jesus. If you, had to, if you had to be made right with God, if you had to be righteous before God by showing up and handing God your report card and there was nothing negative on it, some of you probably have a better report card than I would have. But that would not be good news to me. So the question, if we don't get right with God that way, why then do we have the law? And he says in verse 19, why then was the law added 
It was added because of transgressions having been ordained through the agency, uh, through angels rather, <clears throat> by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. That's a mouthful right there in verse 19. It is added uh, because of transgression, he said, and... Um, Okay, let me, I always get ahead here. It was added because of transgression. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? Well, if you stop and think about it, where do you find out about sin? Where do you find out about what is right and what is wrong? And there's that passage from the pen of Paul where he says, if it had not been for the law, I wouldn't have known about something like covetousness. I wouldn't have known about this. I wouldn't have known about that. And so it was added on account of, uh, on account of sin. That's the reason why the law was added. And by the way, there were times later on then when Paul, of course, who had tried to achieve justification on the basis of law, is going to be accused of um, of treating the law negatively in Acts chapter 21 and verse 28. This is the man who preaches to all men everywhere against our people and against this place. What did he really have to say about the law? And so here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, he is going to give us a reason why we have, why they had the law, why the law of Moses was given. Interesting here that he says, it was given for the sake of transgressions. What is a transgression? What is transgression? I, you know, think about the three-letter word sin. There are a lot of different ways in the Bible in which the idea of sin is expressed. One of them is the word transgression. Probably implies that we have overstepped the law of God in ancient times, the word would have been used to speak about a deviation from the original, a deviation from the true direction, and uh, that really implies an obligation that was not kept. Here's the standard. Here are the instructions. Uh, here's the original, if you will. Transgression means to overstep that, and sometimes... We transgress for any number of different reasons. Sometimes we do it deliberately. Sometimes we do it intentionally. Um, I've known brethren who took that type of casual approach to sin. I'm going to do it my way. Maybe God says I ought not to do this, but this is what I want to do. <clears throat> and so I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do. Sometimes we do it because we're too stubborn to listen to God. Years ago when I was in college, there was a speech class. I was not in this class, but I have heard this story from several people who were in the class. There was a speech class. A test was handed out one day, and the teacher says in handing out the test, read the directions before you answer any of the questions. Now, we husbands are famous. We're renowned for not reading directions. I uh, get something I've got to put together, and with no children living at home, that happens less frequently. Before going through 20 pages of directions, I want to see all the parts. See if I can quickly figure out where this one goes and where that one goes. So we husbands typically don't read the directions until we've messed up. So this test is handed out. The teacher says, please read the directions. Well, one person who will remain anonymous was not me. Remain anonymous because some of you probably may know his name. He just tears into that test, writing down answers, one after another after another. The very last question on the test, stand up and say your name to the class. He got to that question. He jumped up 
My name is blank, blank. And everybody started snickering at him, laughing at him. You know why? You remember, read the directions. The direction says, do not answer any of these questions. I think it was kind of a test in communication, how well we communicate. Sometimes communication fails because somebody doesn't listen and he didn't listen, he didn't follow directions. Sometimes we transgress because we intend to transgress. Sometimes we transgress because of maybe stubbornness that we have within us. And sometimes we transgress simply out of weakness. An obligation is given. We fail to keep that obligation. And there are a couple of ways you could look at that. We could suggest that the law was given in order to make provisions to deal with our sin. I don't think it takes long <clears throat> to dismiss that idea. They did have animal sacrifice in the law, even though they did not take away sins. That's, that's really not what that's talking about. I think to understand that, what Paul means there is given because of transgression is to think about the law itself. And again, that awareness of sin that it raises within us. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7 is where we find this particular statement here about transgressing the law. I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So of what does this particular book make you aware well, maybe several answers to that question, but it certainly makes us aware of sin. And that's why some people want to throw it away today, because they don't want to hear one word about sin. That's why some folks don't want preachers to, um, well, you and Tim used to say, Chris, bring the heat. Don't want preachers to bring the heat. Don't want preachers who talk about sin. That means we're going to have to take the scissors to the Bible, right? Just take the Old Testament, take the law of God. If you read it, if you study it, you are going to be made aware of sin. Old Judge Roy Moore in Alabama, I wouldn't have voted for him, you might have, but he became famous for in direct contradiction of the Supreme Court order putting the Ten Commandments in courthouse in the state of Alabama. Big emphasis given there to the Ten Commandments. I'm all about plastering the Ten Commandments everywhere that we can. Basic morality, basic ethics. But don't talk about the Ten Commandments if you don't want to hear about sin, 10 of them, and if that's what you've got to do to be made right with God, well, what does the law of God do? It tells you about sin. It helps you understand, man, this is what the relationship with God looks like. How, how long, by the way, have people been doing that? I mean, committing sin. Right, that's, in, that's very early in the Bible, right? Like Genesis chapter 3. And then you get to the law of God, and there it is written. And you become very aware of the existence of sin, the reality of sin, and its existence in your own life. It's through the law of God that we know about sin, and if in fact we have any sort of conscience, we're painfully aware of its presence in our own lives. The law gives us an awareness of sin. And even reading the New Testament, the Word of God is going to give you an awareness of sin. Guess what we're going to come to when we come to it in our study of the book of Galatians? Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. Do you remember what that passage talks about? Now the works of the flesh are manifest, King James Version, which are these. And if you're as old as I am, 
you have heard preachers bring the heat about the works of the flesh. The passage goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Boy, I, I really want to hear about that. Well, what if you're not keeping that? What if you're not doing that? What if that's not the way that you live? Why was thinking specific about the law of which Paul speaks? Why is that given? He says it was given because of sin. It is through the law that we come to know what sin is. And if we've got a conscience, we're going to feel guilty about that. And so you remember then what he says in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, as you go back to Galatians chapter 5 and verse, uh, rather, verse 19 of chapter 3, it was that because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by uh, agency of a mediator. Then in the next statement, he points to the temporary nature of the law until the seed would come through who the promise has been made. Let me see. Okay, that we're not quite there yet. Until the, the, um, the one comes for who the promise has been made, until Jesus Christ comes and that Christ came. That's what I believe he's saying there in that particular verse of Scripture. Now, verse 19 also makes another important contrast between the law and the promise to Abraham. This verse says that the law was ordained through angels. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? How in the world could it be ordained through angels? Well, the word ordained can refer to an order. It can refer to, um, to direction. Go look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2 for just a moment. Bear with me while I turn the page in my Bible. Hebrews chapter 2, he's talking about the superiority of Christ to the angels. But his point there isn't necessarily about how much better Jesus is than an angel as it is about how much better Jesus is than what was given by angels. And so he says in verses 1 and 2, For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. There's the gospel in that verse. The word spoken by whom? Verse 2. The word, he says, that was spoken by angels in Acts chapter 7 and verse 53. Uh, Stephen, <clears throat> right before they start stoning him to death, talks about how the law was ordained by angels. The King James Version says it was given by, uh, by the disposition of angels. And even in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 33, rather, in verse 2, it looks back to the experience at the mountain, that's Mount Sinai, and says, The Lord came from Sinai, dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand there was flashing and lightning. So that text reflecting back on God's appearance at Mount Sinai talks about his being uh, accompanied by those 10,000 holy ones. So he says it's given by angels. He's not saying bad things about the law, by the way. If you're going to say it's given through the mediation of angels, you're taking a very high view of the law of God. Verse 19 also makes another important point here about it. It was given by means of a mediator. Um, let me go back and read that. By the agency of a mediator, he says. What is a mediator? A mediator is really somebody who stands between two parties. That's an interesting concept as you think about the law giving it being given in that particular way. His role is to work out an agreement between them, and he's always um, working on behalf of those whom he represents. That's a very important part uh, that was played by Moses in the wilderness, given through angels, given through a mediator. We refer to it so often as the law of Moses. I happen to believe that that's the mediator he's talking about there. 
All right, so he's saying some very important things here about the law of Moses. And in Exodus chapter 20, you have the recording of the Ten Commandments, the giving of the Ten Commandments to Israel. In verse 18 of that chapter, immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments, he says that all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning and the flashes and the sound of trumpet and the mountain smoking and the people saw it. They stood at a distance. So they're showing great reverence there for that. The people were scared to death. They said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen. Let not God speak to us lest we die. Given through angels, given by means of a mediator, they saw the glory of God. What do they want Moses to do? They wanted Moses to stand between them and God. Oh, don't let him talk directly to us. You speak to us on behalf of God. And so uh, all of this that he says here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, uh, fits very well with what we see there in the Old Testament. And it's at this point that I believe we see a big contrast between the promise and the law that was added to it. There were both angels, Moses, who stood between God and the people, um, and that's addressed in the law. But on the other hand, the promise was given by God to Abraham. Who stood between Abraham and God when the promises were given? You go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Who stands between God and Abraham? There's nobody in that passage standing between God and Abraham. Giving the law to the people, and there's Moses standing between God and the people. In the case of the promises of God, there is no one standing between Almighty God and our, our father Abraham. And so, again, just think about what he says about the law of Moses. Think about what he says about the promises of God through whom Jesus comes and through whom we receive the gospel. And so, which of the two is enduring? The law or the promise of God? We look at Galatians chapter 3 in verse 19. It was added, that's the law, it was added because of transgression, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Why was it given? It was given because of sin. How was it given? Mediated by angels, given by this mediator, Moses. For how long? Until the one came to whom the promise had been made, the one to whom the promise related. Any questions or comments about any of that? Well, let's take a look a little bit further then. I cannot keep up. That's why I don't run this thing when I preach. That's the last slide I've got. All right, let's go on and, and look at one more thing here. Somebody may very well ask, is the law contrary to the promise of God? God anticipated that question and he answered it in a very, very firm way in verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. It's what the Greek literally says. Sometimes in the King James Version that comes out, God forbid. Literal translation would be, may it never be. Was it contrary to the promise of God? You see, here's the law, here's the promise of God contrasted. It was not contrary to the promise of God. In fact, he goes on to say, if the law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness could have indeed been would have indeed been based on the law. And his point is, of course, that that's not how righteousness comes. Remember the report card? You're going to walk up to God. Here it is, God. I've got straight A's. Well, if you could get it that way, if that's how God intended for it to come, could you think of a better way to provide that than through the law of Moses? Is it contrary to the promise of not at all? 
if a law had been given which could impart life, righteousness would have come through that law. Find something wrong with the law, if you will. Find something wrong with it. Aside from the fact that it can't do what we ultimately need, and that is take away our sins. Now, you may find things in the law you don't like. You might find things in the law that you find objectionable. But aside from the fact that it can't take away sin, what can you find wrong with it? Absolutely nothing. It was perfect in every way so far as accomplishing what God intended for it to accomplish. But the one thing that it could not do was to impart life, to take away our sins. You see, in this passage, what he does, rather than attack the law, as some accuse him of doing, he understood his purpose and um, his place in God's eternal purpose. He recognized the invaluable role that he played, but his problem was twofold. One was that it could not take away sin. The other was it made no permanent provision for sin. That's a real dilemma, is it not? Tells you all about sin. You can't possibly keep it perfectly. You're going to sin. But where in it is any kind of provision to permanently take away your sin. And I would direct our attention back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. When it says in regard to taking away sin and the blood of bulls and goats, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So he had a very, very high view of the law. But he realized that's not where it's at. That's not how we get right with God. We're justified not by the law. We're justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Well, Paul, why then was it given? And I think he answered that question very well. Does anybody have a question or a comment? All right, Chris. I'm going to come back here so I can hear you. Do you want to live without law? That's kind of what you're saying, isn't it? And so we're not going to detract from the concept of law. And I would also submit that though we're under a different covenant, what you're saying is a part of the new covenant. You may agree or disagree with that. But I think he's going to prove that here in Galatians chapter 5, beginning, really beginning verse 16. And he's contrasting walking by the Spirit and, and walking by the flesh. And, and when you mention that in the book of Judges, and, and um, in my study of the book of Judges, you begin up here and it spirals down. And the spiral keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And, well, I'll study that sometime with you. For example, did Jephthah really sacrifice his daughter? I don't have any trouble believing that he did if you understand the moral darkness that existed when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, when I was in, in um, high school, long about my junior year, between sitting through English class with my arms folded and my head uh, down taking a nap, I got to read a fascinating little book called Lord of the Rings. Not Lord of the Rings. Um, um, what's that book where these guys are shipwrecked and they wind up on a night? Lord of the Flies. That's, that's what I'm... Any of y'all ever read Lord of the Flies? 
I confuse them because I'm currently reading Lord of the Rings. Have you ever read Lord of the Flies? I don't know whether to say read it or don't read it. It was required reading in my junior year English class. A bunch of boys are shipwrecked. They're the only survivors. They wind up on, on an island all by themselves. Whoopee! There are no rules. There is no law. The only rule they had was whoever had this conch shell that they could blow, whoever had that in his possession in any given moment was in charge. And it didn't take long for it to descend into utter chaos. You've got to have law. You've got to have restraint. You've got to have what you find in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. It tells us about sin. Oh, preacher, don't tell me about sin. Preacher, better tell you about sin. Better tell you about sin. Better tell you about what's right and what's wrong. Because that's part of God's message. Bobby, then we've got to quit. Between law and grace. And what distinction do you talk about? Well, an extinction between the two. Oh, yeah, I thought you were saying distinction. No, extinction. I would say this. You can find grace on just about every page of the Old Testament. The nonsense, the, the, excuse me, the idea that the Old Testament is law, the New Testament grace, that is utter nonsense. The law was given because God is God of grace. But it doesn't do the job so far as taking away our sin. Are we on the same page? Okay, that's the second bell. I got to quit. Y'all come back tonight. I'll try to keep you away.